Thanks for joining me as we try to paint a drug picture of the potassium sparing diuretics. Spironolactone and amylaride are potassium sparing diuretics. The potassium sparing diuretics excrete sodium and along with the excretion of sodium there's going to be an excretion of water as well. On their own, they're not really used very much for their diuretic properties because of the fact that they could actually cause life-threatening arrhythmias from the excess amount of potassium, but they are used in combination with potassium-wasting diuretics. The potassium-sparing diuretic spironolactone and amylaride are not chemically related, and we'll explain that a little bit later, but you need to know that because they'll have different side effects because of that. Spironolactone and amylaride work at the level of the nephron, so let's go into the level of the nephron and try to get a good picture of what's happening. We normally have two kidneys, and each kidney has an average of 1.2 million functional units called the nephron. In the nephron, blood is filtered through the glomerulus, and then the filtrate, or pre-urine, goes through a number of different areas. And these include the proximal convoluted tubule, the descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then the collecting ducts. The filtrate that remains at the end of the collecting ducts is then the urine. It's not able to be reabsorbed back into the blood or changed at all. In any one of those areas of the nephron, if the carrier proteins that are embedded in the cell surface of the nephron allow a substance to go from the lumen of the nephron to the other side, which is the interstitial space, it's very possible that that substance will get reabsorbed into the blood because we've got a lot of capillaries, or sometimes called capillaries there, in the interstitial space that are there specifically to do just that, reabsorb substances back into the blood. With the exception of the osmotic diuretics, which are pharmacologically inert, all diuretics exert their effects either directly or indirectly on one or more of those carrier proteins. And therefore, they affect the reabsorption of some of the electrolytes. With respect to the potassium sparing diuretics, such as spironolactone and amylaride, they exert their actions at the very end of the distal convoluted tubule and at the collecting ducts, mostly at the collecting ducts. And at that spot, it's our very last opportunity to save salt or to reabsorb the salt. And we do that final salt balancing for the whole system right there under the instruction of aldosterone. Aldosterone is a steroidal hormone. Steroidal hormones actually work inside the cells. So aldosterone is the steroidal hormone, and under its instructions, when aldosterone is there at the distal convoluted, very end of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting ducts, there's going to be salt that's saved. So we call it the salt saver. There's two different kinds of potassium sparing diuretics, and they're not chemically related. The first one is an aldosterone antagonist that competes with an aldosterone for the binding site at those distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts. 
and if you're blocking the action of aldosterone, you're not allowing the body to save the last of that salt. So we're wasting the salt. So spironolactone is an example of a aldosterone antagonist. The other type of potassium sparing diuretic does essentially the same thing. And an example of that is amylaride. It does it in a different way though. It actually stops the sodium potassium ATPase pump from pumping. So the end result and most important thing about the potassium sparing diuretics is that they allow more sodium to be excreted and the sodium is going to osmotically pull in the water into the collecting ducts. At the same time though, they're saving the potassium. So this can be pretty dangerous because it can result in hyperkalemia. For a milleride, which is the drug that actually gets right there into the sodium potassium ATPS pump and stops the action of the sodium potassium ATPS pump in the collecting ducts, that's the majority of side effects and contraindications. But for the aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone, they have a lot more side effects because of the fact that they actually not only block the actions of aldosterone, they also block the actions of the androgens. So the androgens are like testosterone and their analogs. So the male hormones, they block those actions. And by blocking those actions, they'll have a lot of side effects uh, for men and women. Uh, for, for the men, uh, decreased libido. Uh, for the men also, there's going to be a changing of the testosterone over to estrogens, and that's going to uh, help promote the development of male breasts. And also for women, there is going to be some problems with menstrual irregularities.